Welcome to a very special episode of our podcast series for financial advisors, The Best of 2020, Top Advice from 10 Independent Business Owners. It's a culmination of the most relevant commentary on independence from a year unlike any other. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, feel free to share it widely. I think I speak for most everyone when I say I'm glad to bid farewell to 2020. Sure, I've shared several times that many advisors have reported this was one of their best years ever when it comes to growth, even as businesses in many other sectors suffered dramatic losses. From the perspective of recruiting, advisor movement was the strongest ever. It seems that conducting due diligence and home office visits virtually didn't hamper the desire to change jerseys or models. In fact, it probably accelerated movement because advisors had the privacy to explore while working from home. But the reality is that the pandemic turned the entire world upside down. Yet as of this recording, the promise of return to whatever the new normal might be is on the horizon. As we start our journey forward, we take a step back to glean the key lessons learned over the past year, and with all that happened, it was an extraordinary task. Because we found that everyone we spoke with on the show, this year in particular, demonstrated amazing fortitude and creativity, whether they were top thought leaders, C-suite executives, recent breakaways, or seasoned business owners. But it was the independent advisors that shared with the greatest conviction that independence allowed them to efficiently navigate the stormy waters that COVID brought with it in ways that their wirehouse counterparts may not have been able to. Yet what was most notable amongst these independent business owners is that they were doing what they do best, serving clients with freedom and customization, communicating regularly, and being authentic and proactive but they were doing it all on steroids as clients demanded more hand-holding and greater care. We also found that in these conversations, there were some common threads weaved throughout, related themes and nuggets of wisdom that we extracted specifically for this episode to come up with answers to the threshold question, why independence? The truth of the matter is, it's not an easy answer because it's different for each and every advisor. At the end of the day, For many, independence isn't the right option. But for these 10 folks who were guests on the show in 2020, eight breakaways and two who built independent firms from scratch, it's proven to very much be the right option. Ultimately, they found that the freedom, flexibility, and control allows them the freedom to serve their clients and grow their businesses in the way they see is best. And for all that we went through in 2020, I felt as though we'd be remiss in not sharing some bonus content, sage commentary from author and speaker Bob Berg of the Go-Giver series, who was kind enough to agree to be one of our first interviews at the onset of the pandemic. His timeless advice is just what we all need to kick off 2021. Let's get to it. seem wrong to start by talking about anything but the elephant in the room, the pandemic. Yet for these folks, while it wasn't business as usual, it certainly gave them the opportunity to shine. Morgan Stanley breakaway David Bonson, founder and managing partner of Newport Beach, California-based The Bonson Group, was one of the first guests who recorded with us at the onset of stay-at-home orders. And he shared some unique insights when I asked him how he and his team were managing. But it's his comments about his experience with the 2008 crisis and one's business philosophy I found most compelling. 
you find yourself again in the midst of a financial crisis. So let's focus on that a bit and discuss how you're navigating these unprecedented times. So I guess first and foremost, how busy are you and how do you spend most of your time these days? Oh, it's it's incredibly busy in, in the context of everything that is happening right now in the world. We, very similar to the 2008 financial crisis, have made the decision that these are the times the clients pay us for. So we are doing more in terms of client outreach, client touch, content creation, providing information and perspective. We're also more engaged as active portfolio managers. So the workload around both client emotional care and portfolio management is heavier than ever. And it's the same approach we took in the financial crisis. And do I believe it will result in, in business growth in the future? It probably will. It certainly did out of the financial crisis. But I assure you, that's not what's on my mind right now. What's on my mind is pulling our clients through this moment, which is what our solemn duty is. Mm, I love that. It's interesting you say that because I think what we're all grappling with is this is not a time to sell, but a time to add value and add value solely and exclusively. And if business growth happens to result out of it, great, but it's it shouldn't be the primary goal. But I think one of the things that this does is really test people's sense of faith, the ability to trust. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, but the ability to trust in what you can't see, to trust in the fact that what you are doing today are the right set of actions that will help to impact a better future. So with that in mind, let me ask you a question. Other than over-communicating, what other best practices did you employ in the 2008 crisis that you are finding relevant today? Well, one of the things was the um, just sort of day-to-day practical application of what that client touch means. Having that kind of intentionality and talking to people, you know, it could be as simple as you're used to talking to certain clients on the phone, but you're multitasking sometimes when you do it. And in moments like this, you don't multitask when you're talking to them. You look away from your monitor, you look away from your TV, you look away from your text, and you just get in the moment of, of focusing on the client conversation. That alone, I think, adds to the depth, the empathy, and the relational quality of what you're attempting to do. But even beyond some of those things that might, I guess you could categorize as more touchy-feely, I also think it is a really important time to revisit with clients the philosophy that you bring to their investment management, explaining to them why you have the cash reserves you have, why you have the asset allocation you have. For us as dividend growth investors, it's been a really important opportunity to focus on why cash flow generation needs to be maintained even when portfolio values are declining. And so it's a reaffirmation of principles that you hold dear all the time. I think this is true of everything, Mindy, not just the financial advisor's uh, ethos, but a crisis is not supposed to be a time to formulate your philosophy. It's supposed to be a time to live out your philosophy. I love that. And I think that that's incredibly valid. So what are you hearing from your clients? How often do you communicate with them and what sort of responses are you getting from them? Well, more or less, we're in communication every single day. We're putting out market commentary on a daily basis. We're putting out health updates and various data related to the entire pandemic. Uh, We're doing more podcasts, more videos, just basically that ongoing touch that is all written by us. That is all our perspective, not trying to just circulate someone else's material that I think loses accountability, but also loses integrity. And authenticity. I agree with you. It's that ability to communicate authentically, especially in a time of crisis that Lewis Diamond discussed with Wells Fargo breakaway Joseph Eshelman, president of Sacramento-based Tower Point Wealth. But what Joe also shared was that the variation of messages and media platforms, as well as the speed in which they were able to deliver their messages to clients and ultimately prospects, that was most effective for his firm. It's a process he was able to contrast to the 2008 crisis while he was still at Wells. I know in in following you on LinkedIn and other mediums that in normal times, 
you are extremely active and innovative with what you're putting out um, into the market. So I'm really curious to hear how in a time like this where interpersonal communication is so important, what it is that you and your PowerPoint team are doing differently and what have you kind of kept the same as far as your outward communication um, as you try to navigate this crisis? Fun question, for sure. And I mean, this is one of the, the myriad of reasons why we made the decision to go to a completely and fully independent RIA platform in lieu of, you know, being at the wirehouse uh, as we were a few years ago. Perfect and, and central example of uh, the question that you asked me is the importance of video and the, the, the ability to really scale a message not just uh, you know through an email or, or even through audio via a phone call, but to be able to scale a video message to a wide audience has been an extremely powerful and impactful way for us to make a difference. We've been doing some video work in the past, put together uh, what we call PowerPoint tips, where we were talking about various topical issues that we felt uh, would be of use to prospects and the clients. But in this case, I immediately recognized that we had to get a message out as fast as possible to as many people as possible and do so in a cohesive, intelligent fashion. And so we were able to script and film and produce a six and a half minute special PowerPoint message given by me uh, to our entire audience within 48 hours. That's fascinating. And given that you're your own registered investment advisor, what was the approval process or any sort of legal work you had to do before making this video, which presumably at least talked a little bit about the market, out to your client base and to your prospect list? Uh, it's a great question. Well, in addition to being president, I'm CCO. And uh, because we're a six-person boutique firm, again, we're able to truly move with alacrity. So we do work with an outside compliance firm that helps us you know, go through and make intelligent decisions from a compliance standpoint. But uh, after a quick review of the script, we were off to the races and I'm the CCO. So I said it's a go and we were good to go. It must be just completely night and day between where you are today in April of 2020, navigating this crisis. But thinking back to 12 years ago or so in 2008, 2009, when you were an employee at Wells Fargo, how did that experience in 2008 inform what you're doing now? And can you compare and contrast what a day in the life of, uh, of Joe Eshelman has looked like in these two different operating environments? Oh, boy. Talk about absolute paradox in terms of environment. You know, uh, <laughs> it should not come as a huge surprise, but, you know, it literally is night and day. And, I mean, I think the one good thing about if you want to call it good, having the experience of going through you know, the dot bomb of 02, and then obviously the Great Recession and the financial crisis of 08, is obviously advisors, you know, if you're intelligent, smart, proactive, I mean, you earn your stripes in terms of just understanding the, the art that goes into having delicate conversations with clients. I think that's you know, only a skill that's gained with experience. I don't think there's any other way around that. Conversely, in terms of the ability to communicate with clients and prospective clients in a way that's efficient and suitable to what they're looking at. Everyone wants to be communicated with differently. To have 20 different levers to pull instead of three different levers to pull has truly been you know, a night and day difference on the independent side. And obviously, it's a huge and scary step to make that choice. Again, Lewis, all the cliches are true in terms of wish we would have done this earlier and clients wish we would have done it earlier as well. But uh, to be able to have this competitive advantage uh, over anybody who's an employee of any major firm on Wall Street has been, you know, it's, it's why I get up at 430 every morning. I'm going to get charged up by it. And, you know, it's, you've got this opportunity to win and to, to pluck low hanging fruit. And uh, so I, you just, I, I don't want to waste a minute of, of this opportunity not only just being independent, but unfortunately, this crisis has created a lot of opportunity and we don't want to miss it. Beyond communication, independent advisors share that the ability to shop the street 
and deliver conflict-free advice is what they found to be one of their biggest selling points, allowing them to be true fiduciaries and compete with the brokerages they came from. Lewis Diamond and Merrill Breakaway Lizzie Evans, managing partner of Evans May Wealth, talk specifically about this. So let's circle back to your decision to ultimately leave Merrill in 2019. I'm sure the process um, took form in maybe 2018, early 2019. But what were some of the things that you felt you needed to do for clients as their advocate and their consultant that you felt limited from doing while at Merrill? Well, gosh, if we think about what we were limited to do and then look at going forward, what we're able to do under the independent platform, I have so much more knowledge today than I did even a year ago. And we really started our due diligence process, as you mentioned, in 2018. So, no, I think one of the big reasons was open investment architecture. So, With open architecture, we now have better access to technology, products, and services for our client. And really, there's virtually nothing that we can't help our clients solve in the financial services industry. So I think our ability to tailor sophisticated solutions for families and really provide conflict-free advice was ultimately the reason that we decided to leave from an investment standpoint there's a what we found in the independent channel is there are a lot of funds that have had unbelievable performance or investment managers that have had unbelievable performance with great risk metrics that don't have to participate in a big wirehouse pay to play model and so we felt like we were becoming more and more limited on what we were able to do from an investment standpoint and from a communication standpoint i really think that Clients are paying us to have an opinion and the ability to communicate with them in an open and honest forum and to be able to express why we're doing what we're doing is hugely important. And so we've been really excited to be able to communicate with our families in a much more frequent manner and through avenues that didn't exist before, like video. So we've been doing a lot of video messaging, um, which is something that just wasn't even in the realm of possibilities before, especially, you know, when you think about this year in the market, when COVID hit, we were able to shoot a video and send it out within 24 hours, which really created a sense of assurance and peace of mind in a very, very volatile market environment. And the response that we've received from clients has been overwhelming. So, I could give you countless examples of how we've transformed both our investment discipline, our communications with clients, our marketing, our prospecting as a result of things that we're able to do now that didn't exist before. And I think as I look at our growth, that's certainly reflective of of the endless opportunities within the independent channel. So you think the grass is going to be greener, but you don't really know. So (laughs) you're very hopeful that the open investment architecture and communications will be better, but you don't know until you're on the other side. And I can tell you now, one year later, we absolutely feel that it was the right decision for clients and the right decision for our business. And we're hearing that on a daily basis from clients. And it's certainly reflective in the number of referrals we've had from our existing families. Which brings us to another topic retiring place programs, and next-gen inheritors. One of the top trends that started in 2020 that we expect will accelerate in 2021 is that next-gen advisors will be more proactive in pushing their senior partners to consider options beyond their firm's retiring place sunset programs. These younger advisors are more concerned about being locked up for the next five to seven years with programs like Merrill CTP, UVS's Alpha, and Morgan's FFAP, and the negative impact that lack of optionality will have on their overall business development. In this same conversation, in fact, with Lizzie and Lewis, she shared some thoughts from her experience. You had shared with me that your your father was a 45-year veteran at Merrill. Um, 
and you had worked with him there for a couple of years before he ultimately retired. What were his feelings about you leaving Merrill? It couldn't have been an easy thing for him to hear. No, it certainly wasn't. I worked with my father for seven and a half years at Merrill, but he's been my father for 33 years. So we think a lot alike, both in terms of investment strategy in the business. And really, Merrill was part of my entire childhood. I still remember all of the Maryland trips and events that we attended as children. And so really the decision to leave was not one that Brooke and I took lightly. I can tell you what I've told him about the reasons why we left Merrill. And, you know, I think first and, and foremost, it really isn't Merrill anymore. You know, I think whether you've worked there for five years or 45 years, in my opinion, Bank of America really destroyed the entrepreneurial culture within the company. And as I look back on it, I don't think of leaving Merrill. I think Merrill changed and transformed into Bank of America well before we made the decision to leave. So, you know, that was really the most important reason. And secondly, I really believe my role as an advisor and the success of our business is driven by being a true fiduciary to our clients. So when my compensation is tied to how many mortgages I sell or how many banking products I offer, I just, it seems to me like something's broken. So ultimately we left really because we felt like as we look to the future of the business, really our priorities for the clients and for the business with how Bank of America had changed and where it was headed were to line. So we try to always have a client first mentality. And we really felt like, you know, our decision to leave was an outgrowth of the client first mentality that it really just was a transition at the bank. Thank you for sharing that. It sounds like some very compelling reasons to take your business independent. And how about the CTP agreement or the sunset agreement that you and your father entered into? It's obviously an extremely common and in many ways a fantastic way for a first generation advisor to pretty seamlessly transition the business to the next generation and get compensated for their life's work. Would you mind sharing your thoughts on the program and how you would counsel an advisor like your father who entered CTP, but also an advisor like yourself who stands to inherit a book of business? What were, from your standpoint, the merits and the drawbacks of such a structure? You know, from my perspective, I completely understand the, the structure of CTP. As you think about the, the way CTP was structured at Merrill from the firm standpoint. But I think, you know, if you, if you put yourself in the shoes of the advisor close to entering CTP, as well as the inheriting advisor, in both cases, it's really a decision to lock your business into Bank of America for the foreseeable future. So, you know, I think the retiring advisor needs to ask themselves, to, you know, take a hard look in the mirror and really ask themselves if they believe that Bank of America is the right platform for their clients for the future. And I think that the inheriting advisor needs to to recognize that they're buying a book and they're going to put in a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous amount of work into something that they ultimately do not own. So, you know, from my standpoint and from our standpoint, as we looked out to the future, I don't think it's a sustainable model. You know, we really wanted optionality. And, and I say we, as I think about buying other practices, we wanted optionality and the ability to structure deals from what made sense from first and foremost, a client standpoint and whether that was the right platform for them and from a business standpoint. And, you know, I think for the retiring advisor, the ability to sell your business and receive roughly identical multiples on fee-based and transaction-based business, but receive capital gains treatment versus ordinary income, that's a huge deal. So, I don't think that, you know, the tax difference is something to be overlooked. 
Yeah. And, and something that you've, that you've mentioned is the fact that it's you as the inheriting advisor who's putting in the sweat equity and is, is really buying the book and you're buying it for Merrill because at the end of the day, the firm views it as their book, it's their clients and they own it. So it seems like it's not necessarily a, a fair trade-off when you're the one who's putting in the blood, sweat and tears. And there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that go into it. So really to have a successful transition of a retiring advisor, it's, it's a very long process. So to put all of that time in to something you ultimately do not own, I just think it's something you have to consider very wisely. Former Merrill Resident Director Melissa Bouchelon, now managing partner of Savannah, Georgia-based Soundview Wealth Advisors, also had the complication of CTP for a retiring partner to be considered when they were moving. Plus, the team made a conscious decision to leave $150 million of their billion dollars in assets behind, essentially shrinking with the intent to grow. But it was a focus on the long term and their ability to best serve their clients that ultimately drove the decision to leave Merrill. You also mentioned to me offline, Melissa, that you had an advisor on your team at Merrill that had just gone into CTP. And for anybody not familiar, CTP is Merrill's career transition program, and it is essentially a retire-in-place program for a senior advisor to monetize his life's work and for the next gen to inherit that business. So would love to hear what your thought is about that in terms of what your advice might be or how you might have thought about being the next gen inheritor to somebody considering CTP. At the time, and when we did it, the programs have changed some and and it was much more focused because we had done it, I think it was a four-year program, so you figure eight 2014. It was less of kind of that lock up, hey, gotcha, next gen advisor, and really more of a way to make sure that a senior advisor wouldn't have to leave again to monetize their book and that they keep the clients at the firm and transition them to the next gen. And we had a great advisor that I had worked with in both offices that I had, I had managed at Merrill Lynch and she was getting close to retirement. And so it made sense from a fit within our team. When I kind of, if you fast forward to the CT pa- T packages of today, they're very different. They're exactly what you had just mentioned. It's the, yeah, here we're giving an attractive package to the advisor that's retiring out so they can monetize their book. But really what we're trying to do is lock down. And if you look at the terms and the conditions of those packages today versus when we entered into them, they're much more restrictive and much more of a lockup because they are using it as a tool in a way to kind of keep the next gen in their seat and stuck. So it's definitely evolved over the last five, six years as to how firms are using them from a strategy perspective. In our case, I would say using focus and having a CTP advisor it had nothing to do with one another in our case. What, what really was important for us as related to the uh, CTP advisor is that we felt very strongly that we wanted to honor our commitment to her and she was going to retire at the end of February in 2018. So she could know nothing about anything that was happening. But then also we wanted to get her to retirement and get her out so she didn't have to be kind of left behind. And then we leave, you know, we didn't want to do that to her. And then we felt very strongly because she was a committed 35 plus year veteran at Merrill Lynch, very committed and dedicated to her clients. We felt strongly about making sure that the clients that she had entrusted us with we could at least call and reach out to. So when we left and we made the transition, we were in the last year of our commitment. If we had waited one more year, we would have been able to just add her clients to the protocol list and call them. But we did end up having to write Merrill Lynch a check in order to have the ability to at least call her clients and let them know we had moved to Soundview Wealth Advisors. And we just felt strongly about that. Again, you get one reputation, right? And so If you do the right thing, we're big believers that it works out. What did that look like? So it went from being considered a billion dollar team, which is, you know, the pinnacle of being a top advisor to what did it shrink to when you left? It shrunk to about 850 million. Was that hard to do just psychologically to go from that ultimate threshold of a billion down to 850 million? 
I think the psychology of an advisor is assets under management, assets under management. The psychology of an entrepreneur is a bit different. It's building an entity that you can serve your clients and serve them in the way they expect to be served, where you can truly put them first, and then also focusing on revenue and not so much assets under management. Assets under management matters, but what really matters is that we could create a firm that clients would come to and we'd be able to serve them moving forward. And so it's a, it is a mindset shift. And it does involve risk, and it's very different than 20 years ago, where there was assets under management. How you know how many do you have an assets under management? It was a shift, but we were able to get over that hurdle, and that came early on. We knew the only way to be successful as entrepreneurs and as an RIA was to bring over the right clients. And then obviously, too, as we are looking and our our forward-looking strategy towards growth, as other advisors come to join us, and as we merge and look at other RIAs to potentially come join Soundview Wealth Advisors, having the access to the capital, having access to that same team that can help us do the due diligence around whether or not it's a good fit, and then even being able to construct our own sort of packages for people so that when they come over, rather than having to opt for the CTP or transition program at a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley, they can have that sort of same retire out ability through an RIA like ours. Many advisors struggle with whether independence will be a viable option for them, particularly if a portion of their book is not portable. So we found in our conversations that the shrink to grow concept is not a unique one. Morgan Stanley breakaway Jason Fertitta and his team found themselves in that position in April of 2019 when they opted to leave behind two-thirds of their $6 billion in assets book upon departure from Morgan to build independent firm Americana Partners in Houston, Texas. And here's why. So a couple of questions about that. One, you got smaller to get bigger. Because let's just clarify, you were at six billion when you left Morgan Stanley, and you're celebrating being back to three billion today. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, Wall Street firms put these crazy things out there, these these hurdles when they recruit you, right? So they say, you know, if you can get to six billion in AUM, we'll pay you all this money, right? Well, well, the easiest thing to do if you're a producer that has a good Rolodex is call one of your contacts or friends who has a gigantic single stock position that has no intention of ever selling it or doing anything with it and asking them to deposit it with you, right? In most cases, those families have demands on the firm that is the custodian for those assets in terms of their inability to rehypothecate those shares. But as the advisor, you don't care about that, right? You're just trying to figure your asset hurdle. So our first bucket, which was a single stock, was purely there to trigger asset hurdles for our team to get the ridiculous money that Wall Street was offering us to build our book. Again, that has nothing to do with the RIA space. And so those assets went back to uh, to um, really the transfer agent after we left Morgan Stanley. That, you know, they're not sitting at Morgan Stanley anymore. The families would have been happy to put them with us at Schwab, but it just, again, it doesn't do anything in the RIA space. The brokerage business, after we left Morgan Stanley, April 26, I think three months later, Schwab went to no fees, no commissions on brokerage business. So none of the clients that we work with pay any transactional fees for research and trading like they did, you know, in the old days. We always felt like that business was a melting ice cube and that we needed to focus on different types of business, even while we were at Morgan Stanley. And, you know, sure enough, that event occurred after we left, shortly after we left and Fidelity followed suit and so forth and so on. But we never wanted to hang our hat on that $2 billion because we knew that it was a dinosaur was going away. So what we did was we went to our clients that did transactional business and said, why don't you let us put an advisory fee on your brokerage account? That way we're fiduciary, you know, it's under our umbrella. We're required to focus on it. It's not a self-directed account. And we'll match the historical brokerage business you used to do on those assets to a, a low advisory fee. And most of our clients were fine with that and they actually appreciated it. And so we have a substantial amount of that bucket. It's just now in an advisory fee versus a brokerage fee. 
And then the last bucket, the $2 billion in manage, well, most of that came. There's only, I think, two clients that we really wanted to come that didn't. And so uh, we're very pleased with, with the way our book, and we are celebrating the fact that it's $3 because it's the right kind of $3 billion. Yeah. So let me ask you a question relative to that. And by the way, that makes perfect sense to me because a lot of advisors we talk to, you know, get sucked in, if you will, to the notion that I am an advisor that manages a billion or I produce 7 million, 8 million, 3 million in production. It's a number that if you're an employee of a big firm gets celebrated, not only celebrated, but it's how you get paid maximally. And what you're talking about is really moving and getting smaller to get bigger and celebrating being smaller because as you just said, it's the right 3 billion. And what you'll do is grow now from there. Exactly. And like I said, we could have had $8 billion if I'd asked for it, right? But what I found most compelling in my conversation with Jason was this statement about how his clients responded to the team leaving Morgan Stanley. I didn't have an appreciation for how much our clients wanted us to go independent. When you're sitting inside of a big bank, the easy thing to believe is that the big bank's brand logo is adding value to your business because that's just part of the culture of whatever big bank you might be working at. But in reality, when we left and our eyes were open to how much the clients appreciate the independence and the move to go independent and the the turning down of money from other banks to go from one bank to the other, And so we're actually doing more impactful business and our clients are being more transparent with us in terms of their balance sheets and their goals than the entire time we were at either Lehman or Morgan Stanley. Surely every one of the breakaways we spoke with could have taken big upfront checks that came along with recruiting deals from another brokerage firm, but instead they chose entrepreneurship. And that was certainly the case with Goldman Sachs breakaway Justin Berman, founder and CEO of $3 billion Berman Capital Advisors. It's not only about short-term gain, as Justin shared. You mentioned to me offline that there was a time where you felt not necessarily scared, but uncertain. Oh my God, did I make the right move by leaving Goldman or by not taking a big check and going elsewhere? Can you share with us a little bit about what happened? In terms of not taking a big check, I knew in the back of my head that if I took a big check, I would be set for life and I really wouldn't have to worry. And my motivation of showing up at work every day, would it be there? I knew in the back of my mind, it would be the same stuff, whether I went from Goldman to JP Morgan to UBS to Morgan Stanley to any, it's all the same. And by the way, you can line up independent firms and banks, and we're all the same. There's no silver bullet in this investment industry. And if people tell you there is, then they're just, it's just not accurate. And so if there's no silver bullet, how are you going to get a client when you're going up against a big bank? You're going to outservice them is what you're going to do. And you're going to provide services that a bank probably can't provide. Maybe that's on the tax side. Maybe that's on the legal side. But the day and age of going up against a bank is very, is very easy. Not to say that you're going to win them all, but the only reason why somebody goes to a bank, especially you know, Goldman, is for the brand. It's not because of investment performance, and it's not because of you know they have a uh, they can offer a line of credit cheaper than Berman Capital. That's not true. Our lines of credit are much more competitive than banks because we're not a broker dealer. There's no spread on top of what a Fidelity or what a Bank of New York Mellon offers us. So it's actually probably cost, definitely more cost effective. And then couple that with maybe you charge the client a flat dollar fee. Well, that's interesting because when I was at Goldman, we were all on basis points. And so the business model is such where, yes, the market goes up you pay me more. If the market goes down, you pay me less. But if you've lost money, you still have to pay me. Well, maybe there's a way around that. And so I would say 
That's how you can also win businesses. Think creatively of how you charge clients. Maybe you charge them a very nominal flat fee with a performance fee. So I think you have to be creative because the hardest competitors for us are other independent firms, not the banks. Right. And what about the economics? So, and what I mean by that is, especially 10 years ago, young guy, you know, a long runway ahead of you, never a thought or never looked back about the fact that there are some very aggressive recruiting bonuses being paid, probably even bigger today than it was 10 years ago. But even 10 years ago, the transition incentives were pretty large. What about the thought of leaving chips on the table, the notion of not monetizing the business mid-career at that point? It's really simple. I would have made $20 million to $25 million at some banks, and I still have their offer letters today, and I would be set for life. However, am I making that money because I'm a great advisor and they want me, or am I making that money on the backs of clients? And so I am selling my clients' businesses for my personal gain. And that, for me, is not ethical. It's this notion of thinking about the long term and prospects for growth that draws so many to building independent practices, essentially building firms with the end in mind, with focused efforts on both organic and inorganic growth playing a big part in these plans. In part one of a two-part episode on M&A, Carl Heckenberg of Emigrant Partners talked about the attraction between acquirers and firms with a proven growth trajectory and strong value proposition. Jeff Concepcion, the founder and CEO of Stratos Wealth Partners, was one such partnership with Emigrant, a deal that was closed on April 1st of 2020 in the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this conversation with Lewis, Jeff shared how his firm is looking beyond the monetization event a sale offered and instead sought an advisory partner, one that would play a greater role in the growth life cycle of the firm. So I think it'll be really instructive to get your viewpoint, Jeff, as the quote unquote seller. What was your motivation behind doing the deal with Emigrant, especially at this, at this part of your growth cycle? You know, it's a great question, Lewis. I think there was a realization probably around a year ago that my focus was just really becoming sort of the best version of ourself. And what's a little bit of a limiting factor is kind of, and it's a blessing at the same time, a lot of the team has been intact. We know each other, we're comfortable with each other. We've been together for a while. There hasn't been very much change, which is a good thing, but it also can be limiting to the extent that there's you know, not this sort of new disruptive ideas. When Lou Camacho came on board, that was really a breath of fresh air. He thought a little bit differently and he was outspoken in the sense that he wasn't, he was comfortable enough to share his ideas quite quickly and kind of challenge the system a little bit. We've had an external advisory board at times and we found them capable of doing the same, but we wanted people who are really more closely aligned with us that could sit at the table. So I would say it was less driven by capital and more driven by the fact that we really wanted to challenge ourselves to be the best firm that we could. And then, of course, the fact that the markets had done well, it wasn't a bad thing you know, to take some chips off the table. It wasn't a bad thing to have access to capital to further accelerate our growth and maybe to stop being as conservative. I think this blue collar mentality and the hard work that's driven us to where we are today has also been a limiting factor the fact that you could have offices in as many places as we did and grow at the pace that we did and essentially have almost no debt uh, is probably odd. It struck people as odd as we went through this process with Liz Nusvold and Silverlane that we could have grown that way without having any leverage. So part of that maturing process is, okay, we're a sound and stable business. Intelligent business owners use a little bit of leverage. They push themselves outside of their comfort zone. And we thought that the right partner could help us to do that as well. Definitely. And without giving up your secret sauce, how does another business owner drive their firm to become the next Stratos if there is a next Stratos? You know, I think part of it's investment, right? I mean, it's that whole notion that uh, we talk about often of an advisor versus a CEO. If somebody wants to grow, they've got to invest in their business. They've got to invest in their value prop. They have to invest in business development, partnering with great firms like yours. I mean, there's a cost to meet talented people. So if you really want to grow, you have to develop a value prop, be willing to invest in it, and it cannot be a part-time job. I can't be running a practice with 150 clients and think that in 
eight or 18% of my time, I'm going to be a rock star from the business development standpoint. You have to sleep it, breathe it, eat it, and live it 24 seven. You don't have to do that to bring on a team or two, but if you really want to grow, I don't think that it can be done part-time. So I think it's a grind. You have to have a great story and you have to work really, really hard. John Cutton, CEO of Cutton Wealth Management, a $2.4 billion firm on the Ameriprise platform, is someone who decided that he didn't just need to think like a CEO. He had to be one to grow and develop processes designed to continuously create scale. He shared some of his advice with Lewis. Can you describe to us that thought pattern? And it's a really important topic because so many financial advisors, no matter where they practice, really struggle with this concept, especially if they're captive at a wirehouse, they might be running a business and they're the CEO of their book, but they haven't necessarily ran a true business. And oftentimes we see that advisors who are incredible rainmakers and business developers and advisors, they sometimes either stumble in being a CEO or they just may not enjoy it. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts around this and how you would counsel someone who was considering the same thing. Yeah, no, great question. I've got a lot to say on that subject. And my belief is, and I, I you know, coach a fair share of advisors outside of my practice and obviously been around the industry for quite some time. I'm big on sayings, right? What got you here won't get you there. And, you know, my belief is lots of advisors, you know, depending on the type of clientele that you are able to attract, right? The higher the net worth, probably the larger the revenue number here. But what I found is a good finder without putting that CEO hat on usually can, you know, run a business to somewhere between call it a million to two million a year in revenue. And then it gets really difficult to grow beyond that. And lots of advisors get stuck if they don't kind of change their role. So, you know, I read an amazing book can't tell you exactly how long ago, but it was quite some time ago by a a gentleman by the name of, and you you may have heard of him, Philip Palaviv. And he wrote a book called The Ensemble Practice, which I recommend everyone listen to, uh, or I should say read. And the thesis of the book, there's lots of great information in there, but my biggest takeaway reading that book was that the average income of a financial advisor is about $100,000 to $150,000 annually if you think about that from a national perspective. Now, of course, lots of the listeners make significantly more than that because they're significantly better than average generally as a finder, right? As someone who can you know, uh, do business development and bring assets into a firm, et cetera. So my takeaway from that and where I kind of had this epiphany was when I thought about the work that I was doing and how I was helping my clients when I was still a practitioner, because quite frankly, I haven't worked with clients at all for a little over nine years right now. What I realized is someone who might have 10 years of experience or even less than 10 years of experience for a very typical kind of mass affluent, which I define as that 500,000 to a few million of investable assets, Uh, An advisor with a lot less experience than me can help that typical client without my involvement, right? And if I wanted to actually scale a company and build an enterprise, the way to do that was to really focus on the vision of what it is that we were trying to build, which quite frankly was how do we help as many human beings as possible in our target market, ultimately with their retirement and their kids' college and estate needs et cetera. And I couldn't do that if I spent my life doing 14 or 15 or 16 meetings a week with my own clientele. So when I was able to kind of think through that a little bit, I quickly decided that, you know, the smartest thing for me to do to really scale the business was to put people in these kind of separate roles and let them do what they're naturally good at. So that was kind of a big part to the growth that we've had as a firm. And I'll just share, you know, Lewis, one of the ways that I really realized this um, even earlier in my career, and I continue to be a practitioner after this, was I had the opportunity to actually acquire a book of business. This goes back in, I believe it was 02. 
And you know, one of the things I could sh- share is I'm happily married for 23 years. I've got four sons. So if you go back to 02, my oldest just turned 21. My littlest guy is 14. And I've got two in between. My wife was very pregnant with our third son in 02. And the acquisition that I had an opportunity to, to purchase I live here in New York, out in Long Island, and the acquisition was actually in New Jersey, which I know you know fairly well. And to get from Long Island to New Jersey, you've got to go over this bridge called the George Washington Bridge, which is no fun feat for those of you uh, here on the East Coast. So I knew that buying that business wasn't the best thing for my family, but I also knew that it was the best thing for my practice. And what I did, Lewis, was at the time, Evan, who I mentioned earlier, in the podcast was probably about four or five years in the business, fully licensed, really my junior guy. I bought the business. I got Evan up to speed really quickly on how to serve clients. I helped him. I took some trips with him. I helped with the process. But to make a very long story short, Evan did an amazing job. The retention on the acquisition was 99%. He gave great advice, grew the book of business, And right there, what I realized was I didn't need to do everything in the practice. And I needed more folks like Evan that I could put into positions so that they can thrive and do what they're naturally good at. So I know I blabbered there a little bit, but um, it's really, in, in my opinion, important that you start to kind of step back as you're looking to scale a business and think about how you can work, not necessarily in the business full time, but spend more of your time working on it. For many advisors, the thought of independence feels like a bridge too far because it just sounds too much like being alone. Yet as the industry landscape has expanded, there are more versions of independence than ever before, offering the community, support, and scaffolding advisors need. For example, Certified financial planner Lori Siegel and her partner Robert Russo left UBS to form Centric Wealth Partners in February of 2019 with Raymond James Financial Services. I asked her about the decision to choose the independent broker-dealer route and her desire to leverage a more turnkey option, as well as to contrast her experience to being an employee at UBS. Here's what she had to say. And there's many, many independent broker dealers. And then you've got the RIA space. So lots of flavors of independence in this mainstream option of independence these days. Why Raymond James? Yeah, so we didn't want to be in a situation where we had to rebuild or build everything from scratch. So we knew that we wanted to be in a situation where we had a lot of aspects of the business packaged for us, if you will. We also knew that reputation of the firm and just the vibe of the firm, if you will, was really important to us. We don't work with ultra, ultra high net worth people, but we do work with high net worth people. And we wanted whoever we were affiliated with to be a name that they would be comfortable and proud of. So it was really twofold in how we looked at that. Yeah, understood. So aside from Raymond James, what else did you look at? And what I'm asking in that question is not just, so you decided you wanted this packaged or supported independent model, but did you only look at other independent broker dealers? Did you ever consider Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or a regional firm or something of the sort? Never, ever considered any other major wirehouse for me. That was just like going from the pan to the fire. Why would we do that? At the end of the day, we really didn't want to be an employee. We really wanted to be a business owner. We looked at the other branches of Raymond James, if you will. So we looked at becoming an employee of Raymond James. And I love the local management Mm -hmm. at the employee channel of Raymond James. But for us, we just didn't want to be employees anymore. Wonderful. And is there anything that you miss about being at UBS? I mean, you know, one might argue that the support and scaffolding of a major firm could be somewhat comforting 
at a time like this. So is there anything you miss, you know, from where do you get your thought leadership, your research? If there's a technology issue, where does the scaffolding come from now? So we still have the thought leadership and the research because we still, we have Raymond James research now, which is excellent. Even when we were at UBS before, we looked to outside companies for research and we do that today. If we have a technology issue, there's a department. I guess what I would say is there isn't a branch manager now to funnel your questions through where they act as sort of the cop that tells you which way to go to get your problem solved. Honestly, the only thing that I can say that is missing that you have to create for yourself is if you talked to people, if you were in an office of 40 or 50 or 100 advisors and you were social before, now, you know, you have your small team, whether it's the five people that we have or it's 10 people. So what I would say is that I probably go to more offsite lunches that partners provide mm. because then I'm seeing and interacting with more advisors and generally other independent advisors that are also business owners. So you have both the financial aspect as well as the business owner aspect. I think you bring up a good point that it's about being creative and open to finding community in different places. Absolutely. And really from the time that we started looking at Raymond James, the different advisors and different businesses across the country were more than happy to get on the phone with us sometimes multiple times to share what they wish they had known before. Yeah. And despite the expanded landscape and options to support breakaways, independence may not be for everyone. As Morgan Stanley breakaway Lee Korn, now principal of Opal Wealth Advisors, shared. If I'm a wirehouse advisor and I'm seated at any or any an employee of any traditional firm, is there anything that you would want me to know that we haven't talked about? Anything that you wish you'd do differently? Any advice? Hmm. Good question. We talked about a lot. Do your research. You know, uncover every stone, be true to thyself. You know, we talked about that earlier. Really look at yourself in the mirror and understand what your capabilities are, what your appetite. Uh, this is not launching your own business, any business, but I'm talking about this business now, is not for the faint of heart. It is a misconception that you're going to launch your business, you're going to make 50% more money, you're going to do the same amount of work, and everything is going to be okie dory. I mean, it happens. I've heard the stories of the one guy who, who opens an office. He has one admin. He manages a billion dollars and life is great. I mean, that I guess that that does happen. There are people out there. But to open up a business, uh, understand there is a reason that you're going to earn more profit It's because you're going to put the work into it and realize that there are lots of decisions that you're going to have to make when you're a business owner. You not only have to worry about yourself, right? Usually it's worrying about yourself last. We have staff. We have nine people working for the firm, including us. Those individuals are worrying about, you know, am I going to get paid? Do I have benefits? Is the firm going to last? You know, there are all kinds of emotions that go through their heads. So it's managing the staff. It's also, there's a responsibility on maintaining profitability in a firm, right? So it's not just how much money can I make? Although in the early times when adv I hear advisors talking about going independent, it's usually about I'm going to get a higher payout. I can make more money. Um, I thought that way in the initial stages also. The truth is, it's not that. Probably in the first year, I don't know if you're going to make more money. And usually if you're making more money, it's from profitability. And you have to be responsible with that profitability. Um, you have to have reserves for your firm for times like this. You have to reinvest profit to build the firm. Right? You're not relying on a large firm to make technology decisions, to make marketing decisions. So although I love it, I probably look at our P&L every day. I think that early on, we recognized what were our individual skill sets. We parsed out responsibilities and we stuck to that. And it can be scary. The first time you ride a bike, it's scary. I, I just taught my son in the backyard during this uh, quarantine how to ride a bike. And uh, 
first time, second time, third time, fifth time, he fell. It was scary. Now he's doing wheelies around, around the backyard. And it's that excitement that all business owners are willing to make the leap for. At the end of the day, top advisors, no matter where they sit, are focused on doing what's best for their clients. And it's the thoughts Bob Berg, speaker and co-author of the Go-Giver series, shared on the outset of the pandemic that will resonate well beyond. Could you just share with us briefly, what is the Go-Giver philosophy? Yeah, and that's a great question. It, It basically comes down to this. It's a very simple premise. And that is shifting your focus. And this is really the key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others. Understanding that doing this is not only a a more fulfilling way to do business, it's actually the most financially profitable way as well. And not for any kind of way out there, woo-woo kind of reasons. No, it's actually very logical. It's very rational because when you think about it, when you're that person who moves from a focus on yourself to a focus on making other people's lives better, okay, people feel good about you. People want to get to know you. They, They begin to like you. They begin to trust you. They're much more likely to want to be a part of your life. You know, it's interesting. Whenever I I speak at a sales conference, I'll often begin by saying something like, nobody's going to buy from you. We could say with advisors, no one's going to invest with you because you have a quota to meet, right? They're not going to invest with you because you need the money. And they're not even going to invest with you because you're a really, really nice person who believes in what you do. No, they're going to do business with you. They're going to invest with you because they believe that they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And really, that's the only reason why anyone should buy from or invest with uh, you or me or, or, or anyone else. And the neat thing about that is it means that that advisor who really can shift their focus, who can really make everything about the other person, that's the one who's much more likely to attain the business. As we close our 100th episode, a milestone I had no expectation of coming anywhere near some three years ago when we launched the show, I'm incredibly grateful to all the guests who were kind enough to accept our invitation. But mostly, I thank you for listening. You are why we do all that we can to produce content that will help educate and empower the wealth management industry as a whole. We're excited about our lineup for 2021, and I can't wait to share it with you. Until next time. Visit this podcast page on our website for links to each of these episodes. Plus, I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached by cell at 973 476 8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to advisorhub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.